Hi and welcome back to my channel. Today I'll go over part two for the last minute review for the PMHNP exam. You can follow me at Instagram, TikTok, or Facebook at PMHNP101. You can also email me if you have any questions or concerns. So without further ado, let's get into today's topic. First topic is going to be anorexia. So let's say you have a patient that has a history of anorexia. This patient is complaining of stomach pain. They might complain of feeling of bloating. They might even complain that the stomach is feeling full. And if this patient is complaining of stomach pain, especially after eating, that could be caused by delayed gastric emptying. There are some medications that when you take that can cause this feeling, such as ranitidine, um, medications such as famotidine or omeprazole can also cause pain after eating. And to acids, and to acids such as proton pump inhibitor, for example, such as protonics. Protonics, we know, is a proton pump inhibitor, and it can decrease the absorption of psychotropic medication. You can decrease the absorption of psychotropic medication, and that is why it's important to educate the patient and the families on antacids and the interactions between psychotropic medications. We know antacids, it can change the way the body absorbs other medications that the patient is taking. So let's say, for example, if you give patient Seroquel and Protonix at the same time, that Seroquel may not be effective because you also understand that the Protonix, it's going to decrease the absorption of the Seroquel. And it's best to take any other medicine um, either an hour before or four hours after you take antacids. So let's say you get a six-year-old female, elderly, right? And she comes to your office and you start her on SSRI. What are some of the concerns with this person? Some of the concerns would be falls, right? Risk for falls, risk for fractures, possibly an increase in their anxiety, increase in adverse effects, side effects, right? You might even do an EKG on this person. So when you're giving an SSRI and the opposite of what is expected for this person is happening, it is called paradoxical effect. It's when you're giving a medication to treat, but in turn, it's causing the opposite of what is supposed to be happening, right? So in some populations such as the children or the elderly, sometimes we give this population Ativan even Ativan causes a paradoxical effect. Instead of having a calming effect, it may cause someone to have agitation, irritability, or even confusion, right? And elderly patients taking Ativan are also at a higher risk for falls. So for older adults, for older adults, you can give them benzodiazepine for agitation. And benzodiazepine such as Ativan, it is considered an anti-anxiety drug, and it is effective, right? But it should be prescribed carefully to these older adults because of the risk for memory impairment, because there is a risk for unsteadiness, and because there's a risk for falls, right? And when we give benzodiazepine to the population, elderly population, we know that it can cause them to be more agitated. And the reason being is because benzodiazepines cause cortical inhibition. And this can contribute to the violent or agitated behavior that's experienced in some of these patients. And it, that reaction is called paradoxical reaction, right? Benzodiazepines, it can alter the neurotransmitter concentration, including serotonin. So let me start to talk about photosensitivity. There are some medications in psychiatry that um, we know that are sensitive to sun, right? So some of this medication would be tetracycline or doxycycline, which is not antipsychotic or any psych medication, but psych medication like uh, melaril or thorazine are some of the common medications that causes a photosensitivity reaction, right? So with that said, some of the reactions you might see is mild urticaria, or photosensitivity uh, seen with these medications. And at this time, you would want to encourage the patient to, and educate the patient and let them know, avoid undue exposure to the sun, right? 
Guys, the best way to prevent symptoms of photosensitivity is to limit the amount of time you spend in the sun. So people who are photosensitive should always use sunscreen when they're outside. Covering and protecting the skin would also help to prevent this reaction. So let's say your patient comes and tells you that they're taking doxycycline and you know that they're also taking Thorazine, you might want to consider switching them to another antipsychotic because now doxycycline and Thorazine is putting them at increased risk for photosensitivity, right? So here I have the word apoptosis. Have you heard of it? What is it? It's planned death of cells. In other words, apoptosis is neuron loss or cell death. Neuron loss because of suffocation or enzyme breakdown. That's what apoptosis is. So let's talk about borderline personality disorder versus bipolar disorder. It can be tricky and confusing for some, so I just want to go over that. Borderline personality disorder we know has two phases known as splitting or black and white thinking episodes. Bipolar, on the other hand, has two phases as well, but it's manic and depressive episodes. Borderline personality disorder is strongly associated with life events. Bipolar disorder is not much related with life events. Borderline personality disorder is more related to changes owned by inherited personality, including irritability, sadness, feelings of emptiness, and anxiety, while bipolar disorder has at least one episode of mania or hypomania. It's mostly associated with euphoria and depression. Now, let's take a look back at borderline again. Borderline personality disorder, they have poor impulse control as well as bipolar as well. But now, borderline personality disorder is chronic presenting complaints in patients with borderline. Bipolar disorder has impulse nature and is only associated with the context of manic or depressive phases. With borderline personality disorder, we know this is a mental illness marked by severe emotional dysregulation. These are the patients that present with mood swings that last from hours to days. And they can have depression, impulsivity, unstable personal relationships are very common in these patients. Early trauma, they have history of trauma, brain chemistries are associated with borderline personality disorder. So what's the treatment for these group of patients? Treatment for these are such as DBT, okay? That's your DBT for borderline. Let's take a look at bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder, it's a mood disorder that's characterized, again, with depressive and manic states. Mania can cause excitement, psychosis, and elevated confidence. Now, this group of people, depressive episodes can cause depression and feelings of guilt and fatigue. They have genes and chemical imbalances that are linked to the development of bipolar disorder. So treatment for this would be uh, psychotherapy and medications. So remember, patients with borderline personality disorder can be impulsive. This is going to be the patient that has the imp poor impulse control and has to do with self-harming behavior. So self-harming behavior is going to be most likely borderline personality disorder. Patients with bipolar disorder, they do have an exaggerated self-esteem, grandiosity, and decreased need for sleep. These are the patients that would present to you saying um, they don't need, they haven't slept for three or four days, and they're not tired. And if you have not slept for three or four days, you should be tired. If the patient is telling you or the questionnaire is presented in that situation where the patient hasn't slept for a certain amount of time and the patient is denying fatigue, and the patient's energy was high, it's most likely going to be the bipolar disorder. So the difference would be if the patient is having self-harming behavior, that's most likely going to be borderline, okay? Great, you guys are doing so good. Let's talk about levels of prevention. Levels of prevention, we know there's primary, there's secondary, there's tertiary. So let's talk about primary first. 
So primary prevention we know is aimed at decreasing the incidence. It's to decrease the number of new cases. So primary prevention is focused on preventing and promoting safety initiatives, pre uh, presenting with education, giving the community or the society classes. It's modifying the environment to prevent and to promote, right? An example of primary prevention would be encouraging an exercise or healthy eating habits to prevent individuals from becoming overweight. So this would be a primary prevention thing. So remember, in other words, primary prevention is an intervention implemented before there is an evidence of disease or injury. It's to avoid any illnesses or any number of new cases. Let's take a look at secondary prevention. Secondary prevention we know is aimed at decreasing the prevalence of number of existing cases, right? Number of existing cases, how can we prevent that? Well, some of the examples of this would be early case findings, screening, prompting and effective treatment. So with secondary prevention, the goal is early identification by screening and treatment. And some of the examples would be to check the BMI at every well checkup to identify individuals who are obese or overweight. So this would be an example of secondary prevention. Remember guys, secondary prevention is an intervention that's implemented after a disease has begun, but it's before it is symptomatic. So let's talk about tertiary prevention. Tertiary prevention we know is aimed at decreasing the disability and severity of illness, right? So this is going to be the treatment part to prevent further deterioration. So the goal of this is to stop bad things from getting worse. An example of this would be helping obese individuals to lose weight to prevent progression to more severe consequences, right? And this example would be like uh, rehab, restoration day, treatment day, social skills. This is after. So tertiary prevention we know is an intervention implemented after a disease or injury is established. Conversion syndrome. Conversion syndrome. Now this can occur as a result of stressful experience. So let's say maybe you have a person that lost a parent or family member. Maybe this person had an accident recently or experienced something stressful in their life that led to some neurological symptoms. What are the neurological symptoms? The neurological symptoms that this person would present would be blindness. This person would present with mutism where they're not able to speak. It can also lead to paralysis. They're not able to move. They might be complaining of numbness and tingling, right? So that this is all neurological symptoms presented after a stressful experience. And this can lead, the stressful experience can lead to the symptoms that I just said, like blindness, mutism, para, paresthesia, or paralysis. This is called conversion syndrome. Adjustment disorder. Just like the word adjustment, there's the word adjust in it, meaning you're not able to adjust to it. It could be after a death of a loved one. This could be after divorce problems or a problem in a relationship. It can be after losing a job, some school problems, maybe even sexuality issues, right? So adjustment disorder, there are some symptoms such as feelings of sadness, hopelessness, frequent crying, worrying, anxiety. Remember, so in, with adjustment disorder, you're having adjustment after going through a stressful life event and you are having symptoms of depression. So with adjustment disorder, remember adjustment is having after you adjust to some sort of a trauma or you're having a stressful life event. And the symptoms are very much similar to depression, hopelessness, crying, anxiety. Know that this is different from conversion disorder because conversion disorder, remember I had said, it presents with neurological symptoms. Those neurological symptoms are involuntary. Now, how is this different from depression overall? Adjustment disorder is different from depression because depression, you're having feelings, uh, depressive feelings with somatic and cognitive changes, right? 
That's your key feature. With adjustment disorder now, it's identifiable stressor and marked distress. And you can t say that this is after a certain life event that happened, and then you're having this adjustment disorder. So let me just talk real quick with adjustment disorder versus depression. With adjustment disorder, the duration does not last longer for more than an additional six months. With depression, it may manifest at least two weeks or up to two years. And with adjustment disorder, the severity is less severe compared to depression. Depression, it's more severe. The treatment for adjustment disorder is shorter and it's less in-depth versus depression, it's longer and in more in depth. All right, so let's talk about factitious disorder versus malingering disorder. Malingering disorder, it's more common in men than in women versus factitious disorder, which is common more in women than in men, except in Munchausen's variant, right? Now with malingering, they have a history of substance abuse. Factitious disorder, they have history of employment or some sort of a training in medical field. Malingering disorder patients, they tend to refuse tests and treatment, and these are the patients you'll see sign out of the hospital AMA versus factitious disorder. They're not bothered by invasive procedures. So with malingering, malingering is going to be a child or an adult who fakes an illness for personal gain. An example of this would be a child who doesn't want to go to school. Another example would be like an adult who wants to sue somebody after following a car accident. Factitious disorder now, they don't have any reason for adapting the sick role and it can be attributed to psychological reasons. They're more likely to undergo surgeries and extensive medical treatments. So guys, remember the two differences. It sounds a little bit confusing. Factitious disorder, they want to be in the sick role. These are the patients who would be injecting themselves with some sort of IV, maybe actually giving themselves food poisoning and having that sick role. The malingering is going to be also voluntary. They present with wanting a secondary gain from it. So they're also going to be playing that sick role, but there is a secondary gain. Maybe there is some sort of financial gain or they're trying to win somebody over. There is a secondary reason to why this person is in that situation pre and presenting. This is going to be malingering. So remember for factitious and for malingering disorder, they're experiencing these symptoms voluntarily because they're injecting themselves or doing something to themselves to present the sick role or to present this secondary gain after having a food poisoning, intentional food poisoning with intentions, right? Great, you guys are doing so far so good. I'm glad you're here with me. Let's get into reactive disorder. But before we get into that, let me remind you guys, go ahead and click that like button. Don't forget to share. Or if you haven't even subscribed, go ahead and click that subscribe button. You can comment below on the videos. Let me know what your thoughts are. Let me know what you learned, what was beneficial to you guys. And with that said, let's talk about reactive attachment disorder. Reactive attachment disorder can be commonly misdiagnosed. It's often misdiagnosed to be mood disorder or bipolar disorder, or it can even be misdiagnosed as conduct disorder. So reactive attachment disorder, we can see this take place in children, children with insecurities. And you can see attachment issues as well with these children. Attachment issues would be like they refuse to engage with others, exaggerated distress. They show anger, fear, and anxiety in relationships. They'll even go as far as avoiding people. With reactive attachment disorder, know that it's mostly can occur with children who have been in foster care. This child has been in foster care, going from different house to house, especially if you have a child that has been away from their parents or if a CPS case was involved and they took the child away from their parents and the child comes back to the house, to their biological parents, you'll notice that this child is starting to have very um, seems very withdrawn, shows no emotions towards their parents or their caregivers. So remember guys, reactive attachment disorder, this mostly occurs 
to children that have been in foster care. This would be the key word for you to know that this is reactive attachment disorder. The child appears withdrawn and shows no emotions. So let's talk about conduct disorder versus oppositional defiant disorder, also known as ODD, right? So let me start with conduct disorder first. Conduct disorder occurs in children under the age of 18. This is going to be a person who is presenting with behavioral problems that leads to conflict with authority figures. So some of the examples would be when this person is having aggression towards an animal or somebody else. So they might try to hurt this person uh, intentionally. They might even try to destroy somebody's property. They are stealing and they're angry and irritable. So now let's say if these symptoms were presented in somebody who's older than 18, this would be considered antisocial personality disorder. So a lot of the kids who have previously um, have conduct disorder, they do go on later in life to develop anti -personality, antisocial personality disorder. Let me talk about ODD. Oppositional Defiant Disorder. Now, this is deliberately defiant or non-compliant with rules. Somebody who is frequently losing temper, who is argumentative with adults. This is somebody who is deliberately annoying others, blaming others for their own behavior. They are touchy and easily annoyed. This is going to be somebody who is angry and resentful. And most children with ODD do not progress to conduct disorder. So remember, ODD is a milder form of conduct disorder. The rights are not violated. So let's talk about what is the treatment for oppositional defiant disorder. For oppositional defiant disorder, you want to use therapy for this group of people. And let's talk about the treatment for conduct disorder. Now, conduct disorder is going to be therapy and medications. The goal of treatment for a child with conduct disorder is to target their mood and their aggression. Now, their mood and aggression, you can give them a mood stabilizer. Now, if the patient child's becoming aggressive, you can also place them on atypical antipsychotics. You can also give them alpha agonist or alpha adrenergic receptor blockers. So let me ask you this. Can you think of two medications that are alpha agonist? What two medications can you think of? If you said guanfacine and clonidine, then you're correct. The goal and treatment for these disorders would be to target the mood and their aggression, right? And therapy, as far as non-pharmacological therapy, you can offer these patients individual therapy, or you can also offer these patients family therapy where the child and the parent can have a problem solving skills training. Let's talk about acute stress disorder versus PTSD. Now, both of these disorders, it is caused by some sort of a trauma or stressor, and that's related to this disorder. So let's start with acute stress disorder first. So we know acute stress disorder, the symptoms of acute stress disorder, it's go, the symptoms must occur within that four weeks of the traumatic event, and it can come to an end within that four-week time frame. But now let's say if the symptom progresses more than a month and follows other patterns very similar to PTSD, it's going to be diagnosed from acute stress disorder to PTSD. So what are some of the symptoms that we can see in these disorders? You can see recurrent, involuntary, intrusive, distressing memories of the traumatic event, right? These patients would have anxiety, increased arousal. They would be in distress or social, or they might even have occupational impairment. They would have numbness feeling, maybe amnesia. They feel like they're reliving the trauma again. So let me give you an example. If you have a patient that went through a severe car accident or even know anybody that had went to an accident from 9-11, right? And this person's going to present with you to you with severe anxiety. These patients are going to have some flashbacks. They're going to have some nightmares. And if these symptoms present less than a month, it's going to be, you said it, 
acute stress disorder. Now, if these same symptoms occur more than a month, so they have anxiety, this person's having flashbacks, and they're avoiding, if this symptoms uh, increases more than 30 days or more than a month, this is going to be considered PTSD. All right, so let's talk about Tourette's syndrome. Tourette's, we know, is a condition of the nervous system, and Tourette's causes people to have tics. Tics are sudden twitches. These are movements or sounds even that people do repeatedly. And people who have tics, they cannot stop their body from doing these things. So, for example, this would be a person who might be making a grunting sound unwillingly, or it might be a person who keeps blinking over and over again. Having tics is a little bit like having hiccups, even though you might not want hiccups, want to have hiccups, your body does it anyway. Sometimes people can't stop themselves from doing a certain tic for a while, but it's hard. Eventually, the person has to do the tic. Tourette's syndrome, we know, is a neurological condition that causes both involuntary as well as the vocal tics. Some of the examples, let me give you guys, um, motor tics would be considered like eye blinking or darting, shrugging your shoulders, head jerking. These are considered motor tics. On the other hand, let me talk about vocal tics. Vocal tics would be examples of sniffing, throat clearing, grunting. These are examples of vocal tics. Now, what are the key neurotransmitters involved in Tourette's? The key neurotransmitters that are involved in Tourette's are dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, especially dopamine. Dopamine is one of the key neurotransmitters that's involved in Tourette's. So the criteria for Tourette would be that the child needs to meet at least two motor tics and one vocal tic that has lasted more than a year. That's two motor tics and one vocal tic that has lasted for more than one year. It's important to know that it is normal for young children to have tics. It is normal for young children to have tics, but by the time they become adolescents, that can disappear. And not for Tourette's, okay? So Tourette's, we know that they have to meet the criteria. So the age group that I'm referring to as young children would be the age group of like two, three, four, and six under the age of basically adolescent, which we know adolescence is from 12 and up. And so if any of these children present with one motor or one vocal tic, you know the sh symptom should resolve by the age they become adolescent. And this would be considered normal, right? It should resolve by adolescent. Now, you might get a parent or a family member that is concerned about a child that has possibly a one motor tic or a one vocal tic. You can let them know that this is a normal finding. ADHD is very important to know. We know that frontal cortex is involved in ADHD people, right? And so under the frontal cortex, we know that there are subparts of the brain that are also involved in ADHD. So I just want to quickly focus on those. So we know in ADHD, frontal cortex is involved, right? And so in frontal cortex, there are subtypes, which I'd like to go over. And that is the first one is going to be dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that's involved in ADHD, as well as orbital frontal cortex. We also have ventral medial. So remember, especially dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is involved in ADHD. So when we get an ADHD patient, we know that a lot of these functions are involved in the ADHD patients, right? And what part of the brain is this affected? Prefrontal cortex. It's still part of the frontal cortex. I did want to give you guys an example of executive function. An example of executive function would be impulse control and delaying gratification. Another example would be foreseeing and weighing possible consequences of a behavior. So these are considered executive function. Another example I can give you is like forming strategies and planning or organizing thoughts and problem solving. These are considered executive functions. 
So the key neurotransmitters involved in ADHD, we have dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, and especially dopamine, just like Tourette's, like I had previously mentioned, dopamine is involved in ADHD. All right, so let's talk about OCD. OCD, we have excessive thoughts, which are considered obsessions, that lead to repetitive behaviors, which are called compulsions. So we have com obsessions and we have compulsions. Okay, so let me ask you this. What are the neurotransmitters involved in OCD? The neurotransmitters that's involved in OCD are serotonin and norepinephrine. PANDAS. PANDAS stands for Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorders Associated with Streptococcal Infections. So if you see a child with sudden onset of OCD symptoms, you want to rule out PANDAS because PANDAS can be caused uh, by streptococcal infection and that could lead to OCD symptoms. So if you have a patient that presents with streptococcal infections, you might want to start monitoring them for OCD symptoms as well. And the treatment for OCD would be SSRIs. You can give TCAs like cl clomipramine and also second ge generation antipsychotics such as risperidone, which is off label, but there is data supporting that there, um, you can use that as adjunctive use with SSRI medication. Non-pharmacological management for OCD would be CBT, or you can do exposure therapy. And with exposure therapy, you can do a time limit. So it might be for five minutes or for five times or maybe two times rather than continuously letting them do certain uh, compulsions. So DBT and CBT are two different therapies. We know we use DBT for borderline patients and the main goal for DBT is to decrease suicidal behavior. DMDD, this stands for Disruptive Mood Dysregulation Disorder. Now, Disruptive Mood Dysregulation Disorder, the key word is mood. So this child is going to present to you with moody depressive disorder. They're going to be sad. The parent might complain and talk about how the child is um, irritable. They're angry. There's frequent temper outbursts with this child. So let me give you an example. You might expect a child to get angry when they don't get a toy they want, but a child with DMDD, they might act out with physical aggression and verbal outbursts that are very intense and excessive. So an intermittent explosive disorder, this is going to be a child that presents with impulse control disorders, behavioral disorders. This is going to be the child that has sudden anger, outbursts, or rage. This is going to be a child that's going to have outbursts that are triggered by an identifiable stressor. Unlike in DMDD, there is no reason to why this child is depressed or having an emotional disorder. Um, in intermittent explosive disorder, the reactions are far exceeding the stressor, and it is not because of other moods like anxiety or behavioral disorder. So let me give you an example of intermittent explosive disorder child. This would be a child that you told that you would take them to the park or for ice cream and some things come up for you that you had to change the plans, but in turn, the child starts to cry, they start to kick, they start to curse at you, and they start destroying things. This is going to be considered intermittent explosive disorder, especially when it starts occurring all the time. Whenever they start reacting grossly out of proportion to a situation, this is going to be considered intermittent explosive disorder. So when you are presented with a patient that is irritable, emotionally unstable, they're presenting with sadness or symptoms of depression, you can administer a mood questionnaire to help narrow down your diagnosis. What is Rett syndrome? We know that Rett syndrome occurs primarily in girls, and this is basically the child presenting with loss of purposeful hand movements. They have some development stereotypic hand movements, such as ringing, clasping, or hand mouthing. This is the child that's going to present to you with loss of speech. They have balance and coordination issues. 
they have decrease or loss of ability to walk about like 40% or more loss of all ambulatory abilities. So remember with Rett syndrome, this is going to be the child that is normal in the first five to six months, but over time, the start, this child starts to lose coordination. This child starts to have some speech problems and possibly have some hand coordination problems, right? So motor movements. And this is going to be the child that is irritable. And, you know, there is no cure for this, but with medication and physical and speech therapy and possibly nutritional support, you can help manage the symptoms and prevent complications of Rett syndrome. So in early stages of Rett syndrome, which is considered between six to 18 months of age, we can see this child presenting with irritability. They is, is going to be the child that is presenting with difficulty crawling or even walking. They have a loss of uh, decline of speech skills. This is the child that does not look at you, poor eye contact, has a weak or floppy muscle tone. This is the child that is going to have slowed head growth, okay? So here I have delirium versus dementia, dementia versus depression. And on for board purposes, they're going to test you to find out if you are able to differentiate between delirium versus dementia or dementia versus depression or delirium versus depression. So let's, this is, de this is definitely a very high yield topic to learn and to get familiar with. So let's talk about first delirium. So delirium, delirium we know is an acute onset, right? That causes a short-term changes in the cognition. The hallmark symptom for delirium is disturbances of consciousness accompanied by changes in cognition. And the subtypes of delirium we can see that could be hyperactive where the patient is agitated, restless, hyper alert. You can also see hypoactive uh, clients with delirium. They can be lethargic, slowed, or apathetic. We can also see mixed cycles, right? So mixed cycles of delirium, which will be cycles between hyperactive and hypoactive. Now here on this table, we can see delirium occurs from hours to days. It fluctuates. So we know with delirium, this is an acute course. And once we find out the underlying cause for delirium, we can go ahead and treat this delirium patient. And the examples of what could be possibly causing delirium would be like UTI or alcohol intoxication. Once we find out the root cause of it, we can go ahead and treat this client. Now let's take a look at dementia. With dementia, the course is chronic. With dementia, this is going to deteriorate over time. It's going to be progressive for this patient, right? Delirium patients, their self-awareness, they may be aware of some changes in cognition, but it fluctuates, right? It fluctuates in delirium patients. Dementia patients, on the other hand, they're likely to hide or be unaware of cognitive deficits. Now, let me just go back real quick. In delirium, we know because delirium, because they're unaware of the changes in cognition and it fluctuates, what can we expect uh, is a typical response from a person with delirium when we ask a question. When we ask a question with a delirium patient, they're going to be unable to answer questions, right? They're going to be confused. They're going to be frightened and angry. What is a typical response with a person with dementia when we ask questions? These are going to be the people who are going to try to answer the question. They are going to be unconcerned with any mistakes that they may present uh, while answering the question. And remember what uh, a typical response with dementia is different from delirium, right? Delirium, they're confused, they don't know. But the per person with dementia, they're going to try to answer or they are going to try to come up with an answer to uh, the question that was asked. Now, let me ask you this. What is a typical response from a person that has pseudo-dementia? What kind of response do you think these people would be presenting with? They will try not to answer a question that you are asking. They will have answers like, I don't know. 
So now let's take a look at activities of daily living. Activities of daily living in delirium patients, we know this may be intact or impaired, but we know that this is temporarily impaired, right? Because this is only lasting from hours to days. While on dementia patients with dementia, we know that this may be intact early, but eventually it's going to get impaired as the disease progresses. So we can see the deterioration over time with activities of daily living in dementia patients. Now let's talk about instrumental activities of daily living. This is different. What is the difference between activities of daily living versus instrumental activities of daily living? Feeding, continence, transferring, toileting, dressing, bathing, these are examples of activities of daily living. Now, using a telephone or going shopping, this is a little bit more advanced. So this will be considered instrumental activities of daily living, um, preparing food, housekeeping, using transportation or handling finances. These are going to be considered instrumentals of daily living. So as you can see from the table, there is similarities with delirium and activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living, they're initially intact, right? But if it gets to the stage of dementia, it's impaired, okay? And this is going to be deteriorating as the disease progresses. It's going to affect their ADLs. It's going to affect their instrumental um, activities of daily living. So let's talk about depression. Depression, we know this onset is going to be anywhere from weeks to months, right? And this is going to be a person who's going to present with a low mood, apathetic, and the course of it is going to be chronic. That's not just one or two days and then you're diagnosing this person to be depressed, but it's over time, it's chronic. It responds to treatment, right? We can give medication to these clients. Now this is going to be considered pseudo-dementia, right? Because this pseudodementia is cognitive impairment of severe depression and when they when you ask these patients a question these are the patients that are going to respond with i don't know and when you have patients like that you want to rule out depression and possibly even start treating for depression now let me ask you this what part of the brain does dementia affect if you said frontal you're correct now, in frontal cortex, we can see that there is impaired executive functioning, there is impaired problem solving. This is going to be the person that presents with impaired organizational skills. Their memories are altered. All these functions are taking place in the frontal cortex. Now, we know that there is various forms of dementia and they all have different underlying pathology. So there's dementia with Alzheimer's, there's vascular dementia, there's dementia due to HIV, right? We also have Pike's disease, also known as frontotemporal dementia. We also have Creutzfeldt, Jakob disease, and Huntington disease. Oh, don't forget, we also have Lewy body disease. So let's say you have a patient that presents with memory problems or you suspect dementia. You want to check this person's vitamin B12 or folic acid because sometimes with low levels of vitamin B12 and folic acid, it can result memory problems. You might start thinking that this patient has dementia. Meanwhile, the patient just had low levels of vitamin B12 or folic acid. So you want to make sure you rule out any medical causes of dementia. So sometimes there are students who get confused between cortical dementia and subcortical dementia. So cortical dementia is going to be the Alzheimer's disease, kurtz jakob field disease. These are the two such forms of cortical dementia. Now, the characteristics of these dementia is going to be severe memory impairment. This is going to be the patient that's going to present with aphasia. They have the inability to recall words or understand common language. Now, let me talk about subcortical dementia. Subcortical dementia would be like um, Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease. This is going to be the AIDS dementia complex, okay? And the characteristics with this, these type of dementia is going to be personality changes. This is the person that's going to have poor attention span and they're slowing down their thinking. Or some of the early symptoms for these subcortical dementia, you're going to see this patient present with depression, clumsiness, 
irritability, or apathy. But at the end of the stages of subcortical dementia, this is going to result in the same breakdown of the brain function as the cortical dementias. I hope you guys enjoyed watching the video. I hope you take notes. I didn't want to put all the notes up on PowerPoint because I do want you guys to take notes while I'm speaking and be responsible adults about it. Also, I do want to encourage you guys. I think I'm going to post possibly, I'm, I'm thinking about it. The more that I think about it, I think I'm going to post part three only because there are some topics that I didn't get to include in part one or part two, like neurobiology. Um, and so I would like to do a part three. Let me know what your thoughts are. Comment below. I hope you guys enjoyed and learned a lot from this video. This is just, remember, a last minute quick review for you guys. It shouldn't be the only dependent material for you. Review your books, review your notes, and then this is, should be just a refresher.